So let's get into, let's get into the word, right? So I'm going to, um, I want to open by reading you guys um, a, 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 a excerpt from the guy who actually came up with the, the, the uh, curriculum for redemption groups. And he wrote a book um, called Redemption. And this is an excerpt from that book. And so this message today is in large part about redemption. And this is about Sarah. Sarah was conceived in adultery. Two years later, her mother had another girl by her husband. This is when she confessed to the adultery and revealed that Sarah was not her husband's daughter. He exploded in rage, nearly drowned Sarah, and forced her out of the house. Sarah was two years old. The few years Sarah lived with her grandmother were happy ones, playing, singing songs, and going to church. But Sarah was returned to her mother's home at the age of five when her grandmother died from cancer. While Sarah lived with her grandmother, she'd had no contact with her mother or stepfather, and in the interim, they'd had another child and adopted two more. Sarah's siblings didn't even know she existed. Her return forced her mother to tell the truth about their older sibling from an adulterous relationship. Sarah was an outcast in her own home, and her stepfather treated her like an animal. If she angered him, he might force her to eat food, eat her food on the floor from a dog dish or lock her out of the house. Once, when she was in the first grade, he locked her out for a whole week without food, water, or a change of clothes. She slept outside in the grass and awoke each morning to walk alone to the school bus, her hair matted with dirt and leaves. At least at school, she could escape to a place where she felt human, but she couldn't escape for long. There was always more pain waiting for her when she returned home, and it got worse. She remembers the burning hatred in her stepfather's eyes as he entered her bedroom that first night. This continued early, nearly every night for the next five years. Even this was not the worst of it. Sarah's stepfather beat her, tortured her, and frequently sold her. Sarah lived in a constant state of torment. And so today, I'm the title of this message and the thing I want to talk to you about is a question. And it's a question that I think many of us ask ourselves. And that question is, does God care about my pain? Does God care about my pain? And the big idea that I hope that we walk away from today when we leave here is that you know that the answer is yes, God does care about your pain. And that we only need to look at his redemptive work our redemption, to see how much he cares. Amen? Um, one of the reasons why, so I read that, I want to say, I read that in, in that book, in Redemption, um, Mike Wilkerson's book, and when I read it, it's, it stood out to me so much because um, I've heard that story from no less than 10 people. I'm a social worker, therapist, um, and I, I've heard that story from no less than 10 people, men and women. And it just, it's, it struck me how much pain there is that people experience in the world. But you know what, when I, in answer to, in this, when I ask this question, this is not just for the person who's, who has experienced the most egregious trauma in their life. This is also for the person who's had a long day at work and they come home and they got a migraine. It's also for the person who's frustrated as they're trying to bathe their kids at night before they get into bed. That's me. So, so it includes all of us. So God wants, God wants to be known by us. And, and to that end, he's revealed himself to us in two ways. First, through general revelation. It's what we call general revelation. Look around in creation, and you can see the existence of God. If you, look, if you look in the sciences, you can see how they speak to his glory and his purpose and his ways. And we can all feel, feel the weight of him and the morality that he's written on our hearts, every man, everywhere. And we can sense God in the fruit of the Spirit. 
which man does not generally know and understand, but we, people everywhere, we know that there's this thing, and we call it peace. There's this thing we call kindness, this thing we call love. And then there's special revelation. Special revelation is the way God reveals himself that we come into an intimate relationship with him. This is how we come to faith in him. His spirit calls us and our spirit responds. It's through special revelation that we actually come to know and understand what love is. That we come to know and understand what peace is and what kindness and gentleness is. These are things of God and you cannot know these things unless God reveals them to you. And it's from special revelation that we receive scripture, the word of God, the final authority of who God is and everything that he is doing. And it is in scripture when we look there, we see God that he cultivated a special relationship with Israel, the children of Israel, that he chose them out amongst all people. He chose them to have a special relationship with them. In part, one of the reasons is that God, it was for our benefit. God wanted us today, millennia later, to be able to look back in the scripture and see who he is and what he's like, to see his interaction and his fellowship with Israel. And so that's what we can do today. We're going to look at Israel and God's interaction with him. God came to Abraham and he made covenant with Abraham. He told Abraham, he said, I will make you the father of many nations and all the world will be blessed by your family. He also promised him that he would take him into a land filled with milk and honey, meaning that the land would be prosperous. He told him that he would take him in that land, and the children of Israel, they came to call that land the promised land. And so God made that covenant with Abraham, and Abraham shared that with his son Isaac, and he shared it with his son Jacob. And Jacob, God came to and changed his name to Israel, and Israel was the name of the nation. Israel, the children of Israel. And so God made that, that covenant with Abraham, but he also made a covenant with Moses, the Mosaic covenant. He made a covenant with David, the Davidic covenant. And all of these covenants were pointing to someone, the Messiah. They were all pointing to our redemption in Jesus Christ. And so where we're going to pick up today, and I would like you to look in your Bibles, if you could find Exodus, the 12th chapter, and it's not going to be on the screen, so if you got your phone, pull it out if you have your Bibles. We're going to be looking at the 12th chapter through the 1st to the 13th verse. So we're going to be picking up in Israel's story with God before the Mosaic Covenant, but after the Abrahamic Covenant. This is, um, this is when Israel finds itself in slavery in Egypt. And so there was a famine that was coming in the land. And to save his people, God sent Jacob's son, Joseph into Israel ahead of them to make a way for them. And he did this, that. And so Israel was able to come into Egypt and they had provision during this famine and it was good for them. But eventually they found themselves in slavery. And of course, God said, I'm going to rescue my people. And so he sets out to rescue his people and he sends a series of plagues on Egypt. And where we're coming into the story, this is at the last and final plague. This, this, every time God would send a plague, Pharaoh would say, I'm going to let the people go, but then he changed his mind. But this time, God said, after this plague, they will certainly let my people go. Pharaoh will certainly let my people go. And so this plague is called the Passover. One thing by way just to define redemption. Redemption is an exchange where you get something for paying for something. So this is Exodus, the 12th chapter. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of, of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel 
shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is God's word. And I know that was a lot, right? But I think God's word is way better than me. So we see, the first thing we see when we read this is that this was monumental what was about to happen, this Passover. Like God says, what I'm about to do in this month, your whole calendar right now, the calendar is going to be switched. This is going to be the beginning of the year. So it could have been May. It could have been April. It could have been November. He's like, this is going to be the start of the year because of what I'm about to do in this month. And then he tells them what to do, to take this blood of this lamb and to put it on their doorpost. And then he tells them, to eat the lamb, and then he tells them how to eat it, that they are to do it in haste, that, they, that to do it with your, your sandals on, your belt buckle, your staff in your hand, because you are ready to go. He asked them to do this because the, this, to do this in this way, he even told them to, when they cook their bread to don't even put any yeast in it, so you're not even going to wait until this bread rises because you're about to get out of here. And so this was supposed to be an act of faith for them, that to do this as though they believe God's word, it would be an act of faith. And in this way, they would be saved through faith and by the blood of the lamb. I'm going to say that again. They will be saved through faith and by the blood of the lamb. And so you might, be, you might wonder, you say, well, Mike, you say that they, they were in slavery, and they were in oppression, but I mean, really, how bad was it? I mean, were they like indentured service, or did they just have to work along weekends? You know, they didn't get Christmas off. Like, what did it look like for Israel to have been in slavery? So if you would, turn with me to Exodus, the first chapter, in the eighth verse. We're going to do some traveling in the Word, but I think we'll be blessed by it. So Exodus 1, starting at verse 8. And the word says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities. Python and Ramses, pardon me if I pronounced that wrong. But the more they were oppressed, they, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So, you know, when Israel came into Egypt, it was actually a place of like rest and, 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 and uh, provision for them. It was a place of protection. And so it didn't start out this way. And eventually the king, Pharaoh, he turned against them. And then he got the people against them through a campaign of discrimination. And slowly it moved from discrimination to out and out slavery, formal institutional slavery. But it, did, it got worse. This wasn't the worst of it. 
If we continue on from verse 15 to 22, we see that this, the word says, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sephra, and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And so we see that they weren't just slaves, but it, that it, it even moved to a place of genocide, a kind of genocide. So the Israelites were under oppression in Israel for 430 years. And yet, because of the favor of God, as a people, they grew in number. Eventually, their children saw, were born into slavery. I mean, think about this. Your child is born, and the only thing from the time your child is born until he dies, the only thing you know your child will experience is slavery, never understanding or knowing what it means to be free. I think many of us can relate to Israel's experience. Not literal slavery, but we can understand a lot of the pain that they, they were experiencing going through. Many people don't know what it's like to grow up in a loving home or to have supportive, positive adult relationships. I tell you, I've had more people tell me, and this is, this is for some of the most horrible parents out there, and even for some of the best parents and, and, and Christian, Christian parents, that have, people have told me, said, I've never heard my mother or father say, I love you. I've heard people tell me, I've never had my parents touch me in an affectionate way, or I can hardly remember a time when my parents affirmed me. It's unfortunate, but intimate and faithful adult friendships are rare. And this is something that all of our hearts long for. We might want it on our terms, but we still want it. It's a rarity that you find unity in people putting themselves or putting others before themselves. And if you do find it, if you do experience it, hold on to that fellowship. When there is offense and there's discord, I, I beg you to fight for that fellowship because it's rare in marriage and it's rare even in friendship. And so because of all of these broken relationships, the frequency of it, that we experience it, because of all of our discontent within ourselves, with ourselves, or maybe it's the opposite for, for you, maybe it's our self-satisfaction with ourselves or our indifference, for all of these reasons, in many ways, we, we are like the Israel in bondage or in slavery. Of course, we're not in slavery to the Egyptians, but we're in a different kind of slavery to our shame, to our guilt, to our fear, to our anger and our resentment that are the fruit of our pain from our life experience. All Israel could see in their imagination as they looked toward the future, 430 years, all they could see was oppression. And so they wept under their bondage, and they cried out to God for rescue. And I wonder, I wonder, could they see, could they see in the midst of all that pain, God's grander story? Could they remember the word spoken over God? Because it actually was prophesied. God said, said that they would have a time of slavery, but that he would rescue them. Could they remember God's word over their lives? I think they probably ask a lot of questions that we ask today, contemporarily. 
These are questions, these questions also come out of the redemption book from Mike Wilkerson. How can I trust a God who has the power to make it stop but doesn't? Who is this indifferent God who makes such grand promises and then watches as his people are treated so unjustly? Does he feel anything at all when he hears their wellings? Or does he just stand back at a distance, letting random events, the plans of evil men, and the forces of nature take their course? Does God care? And my answer is yes, God cares. And we know this because he's told us in his word and he's demonstrated it in his person. So Israel cried out to God for rescue and God hears their cries and he promises rescue. And so if you return to me to Exodus, the second chapter in the 23rd verse. Exodus chapter 2, looking at verse 23. And during those many days, the king of Egypt died, the many days of their slavery and oppression. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. I love I loved that scripture and how it ends with, and God knew. God knows. He sees, he hears, and he knows your pain. He's been with you from the beginning. And although he did not cause your pain, his intention has always been toward your rescue. And just as God remembered his choosing of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, he remembers his choosing of you. And I don't care who you are this morning. I don't care if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. I believe that God has ordered your steps to be here, right here this morning. And although we don't know why God allowed Israel to spend 430 years in oppression and slavery, what we do know is that it does not lessen his worthiness of his worship. One of the things I want to tell you this morning is that what we receive in Christ is far greater than what you lose in this life. It doesn't matter, and I don't want to belittle anyone's pain, because your pain is significant and it's real. That's why I started out with the most traumatic of pains, and I also speak to the person who who thought they told last night. God cares. And so it doesn't matter the depths of your pain. The depths of your pain will never go so deep, deeper than God's holiness, the heights of his holiness and his love. God cares for you. Amen? And so what we've received, what we've received is his presence. What we receive is his presence and in his presence is fullness of joy. All of that pain and all of the shame and the guilt and the frustration and the anger, all of that melts away in the presence of God. And my prayer for us this morning is that when we're in that grips of that pain, or even when we forget that we know that that God cares, that we would turn our hearts to run to his presence because that's what we've been given. Amen? Amen. And so, God didn't just tell them what he was rescuing them from, slavery, but he also told them what he's, where he's taking them to, what he's rescuing them to. And so, if you turn with me to Exodus, the third chapter, the seventh, in the seventh verse. And so, this is when God speaks to Moses, and he speaks to Moses through a burning bush, a bush that catches on fire, and it, do, and it is not consumed. Glory to God. And it's not consumed. When Moses approaches the burning bush, he says to Moses, he says, take your shoes off because this is holy ground. And then God says to Moses, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so we see here that God sends Moses as a type of redeemer. Moses points to Christ. Moses was raised as an Egyptian, but he was an Israelite. So what God does is he takes one from among them to stand in the gap and intercede for the rest. And this is what Christ has done for us. Christ has become, God, Jesus, has become one of us to meet all the necessary requirements to redeem us, that is, purchase our freedom. He has become fully God and fully man to intercede on our behalf. Ephesians 7 says that we do not have a high priest who does not understand our weaknesses. Listen, listen to this word. This is the word of God. We do not have a high priest who does not understand what you're going through. He has been tempted, the word says, in every way that is common to man. And that's in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And so we see, we see God's concern for us when he subjects himself to human weakness. We see God's concern for us when he who had no sin in the person of Jesus Christ, he endures the hostility of evil men. He was rejected by many. And he experienced abandonment from, his, from those who were supposed to be his closest friends. Isaiah, the prophet, calls him a man of sorrows who has borne our grief. Wounded, spit upon, crushed, oppressed. Isaiah's not just speaking to the physical pain that Jesus experienced and went through, but Jesus endured the wrath of God. That was the penalty for our sin and our transgressions. In the book of Matthew, before Jesus gave his life, he cried out on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In some way, Jesus experienced a loss of that favor and that fellowship that he had with the Father and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. We cannot even conceive of what that was like. But this is who God is. And this is what he's done for you and me. Does God care? Yes, he cares. He cares so very much. He cares so much that he created you in his image to be his representative in the earth. And he's demonstrated in his person in his body, spiritually and physically, that he's willing to do whatever it takes that his beautiful, his perfect, his holy, his awesome plans for your life will come to pass. But that's the rub, right? His plans, not our plans. Often, our unbelief is a struggle, our fear is a struggle, our shame is a struggle, our guilt is a struggle to trust and rely on God's will and not our own. But fortunately, we have a God who gives us a promise. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, he, he also said, "Where well, the Lord said, I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and follow my commandments. Amen? Amen? So even that part, God will take the desires of your heart, because some of the things that we want, we think we know what's best for us, but some of the things that we want is not really what we need, but God knows. And he says, I will take what you want, and I will make what you want what I have for you, and your life will be blessed. Amen? And so there's, 
just one more, one more scripture that I want to show you, show you. And in order to show you that, we're going to have to fast forward, go into the future a few hundred years. So, you know, the, um, well not, not the future from this time, but the future from where we've been in the text, in Exodus. And so we know that Jesus said, um, that God said to Israel that this Passover thing is a really big deal. And so he asked them, he asked them that I want you to continue to celebrate this going forward. Like every year you're to celebrate the Passover. And so we're going to fast forward to Jesus' time with him, with his disciples. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, looking at the 17th verse. And the word says, at verse 17, now on, the first, now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So during the Passover, the Israelites ate the Passover lamb whose blood would be a sign that their redemption was costly, that it would cost a life. And when Jesus, as they're eating the Passover feast, he said, when he identifies and he says, this is my body and this is my blood, he is identifying himself as the Passover lamb. He's saying that all these centuries, when you have been celebrating this act of what God done, did, all this time, you have been doing this in, in anticipation of me. And this is your real deliverance that is coming because I am the Lamb of God who gives himself for the sins of the world. And so, as I close, my word to you is, is that Jesus is just better. He's the better everything. He's the better Adam, he's the better brother, and he is the better sacrifice. You can trust him and look to him when it comes to dealing with pain. He didn't deny his pain and let it ferment in anger. He didn't ignore his pain and let it and wallow in indifference. And he didn't run from pain, right, and try to run and escape from it and run to addiction or fantasy. But he faced it, and he went to the Father with his pain. And he is our example. This is not an indictment against any of us because none of us have the capacity to deal with our pain in this way. We're to look to Jesus and take our pain to him as he intercedes for us and takes it to the Father. So in closing, I want to just give you, to give you some practical, how do we do this in a practical way? I really, don't, I really don't have a, I've been struggling when I preach to tell people, because when you preach, you're supposed to tell people, like sum it up as to how to do this practically. And I really haven't been able to, to do that. Just the place that I'm, I'm in right now um, is a very abstract kind of place. And so I'm just gonna try to give you something. When I first received the call to plant a church, everyone was, and I started researching pl church planning, everyone was talking about mission and being missional. And when I, I visit some missional churches, and I was in the military, so I got a chance to visit several, um, I saw a lot of great missional work, but I also saw a lot of exhausted people, tongues hanging out their mouths. I mean, they're overwhelmed, 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. And so I thought, you know what, mission is good, but before, as we do mission, we need to do this as family. A family needs to come together, and it's not a program or event, but we do this as the people of God unified, that it's all a life. And then we could do it in the rhythm of our life and mission will be life-giving. But then the family came together and as all of these Christians come together, 
All of our unbelief comes out and it bears all kinds of fruit that works its way against family. Discord, gossip, um, partiality, cliques. And so then I thought, I said, well, you know, this, this isn't working in, in and of itself. So before we have, we need mission, but before mission, we, as we do mission, we need family. But as we have family, we need the gospel. That that family needs gospel. Many people use the term gospel fluency. That the family needs to be able to articul articulate and apply the gospel to their unbelief as they go on mission as the family of God. And then my next thought was, but if we're going to have this gospel fluency, we really got to have the person that the gospel's about, and that's Jesus. And so the place that I've been in is that it's all about abiding in Christ. It's all about Jesus. And so as you think about gospel truth, the gospel truth that was spoken today, the gospel truth that you'll hear in your DNA groups, the gospel truth that you'll read in your Bible, the best thing that I can give you, how do we practically not forget that God cares for us? How do we remember to run to him? I would say is that we use the greatest gift that we've been given. The reason why the gospel is good news is not simply that our sins have been forgiven. That's not a means in and of itself, an end. But it's that we have right relationship with God that we would commune with him. Take those gospel truths and use them through the, pra the practice of spiritual discipline. If that's not familiar with you, I don't have time to look the, the unpack that, look that up. But through prayer, fasting, worship, and even your time with your kids as you're playing with them. Jesus has made it that all of our lives are, are, are an opportunity for worship. Take the gospel, the truths of the gospel, and meditate on them as you spend time with God. Amen? Amen. And so I'm just going to close in prayer. Um, and this is our benediction. Lord God, I pray for us, for your people. If there's somebody right here that doesn't know you, Lord God, that you would tug on their hearts, that you would call them to yourself, that you would take down that stony heart, oh Lord God, and that they would surrender to you. Even let them come up at the end for prayer because there'll be prayer partners here that are willing to pray for people, that they will come and get prayer. And for all of us, Lord, I pray that we could find rest in your person and your work and in our redemption. In Jesus' name, amen.